Uh, if you have your Bibles this morning, now I'm going to be real challenging with you. Oh, they're locked out. There we go. <laughs> All right. Uh, technical difficulties. All right. So uh, if you have your Bibles this morning, turn to the book of Amos. Now I'm challenging you this morning. I'm not going to do a sword drill, okay? Because Amos is a hard fellow to find in the Bible, okay? Uh, he's towards the end of the Old Testament, Minor Prophets uh, area. Uh, I don't know about you, but when I see Amos in the Bible, I always think of famous Amos, the cookies. Uh, so I don't know if uh, some of you do that. I was telling Jacob, and uh, I think he agreed with me yesterday. Yeah, I do think about the cookies. So, Well, we ain't talking about cookies this morning. We're talking about a, a man that I have studied out. And, and really, I tell you, I had no idea what kind of a jewel the book of Amos really is. And uh, it's going to apply to us. And, you know, we always talk about how in our day and age, people like to try to tell you that this book is not relevant to our lives. Well, I found in the Old Testament this book is quite relevant to what we're going through these days. And so I want to share that with you. One of the themes in the book of Amos actually is genuine worship. Genuine worship. There's about two or three themes you can find in the book of Amos. But one of them that is highlighted throughout the book is genuine worship. And I really want to talk to you today about genuine worship. I do believe that many of us, including me, I, I've really recently done a study on worship. I've always been in, infatuated with, with truly finding out what worship really is and what does it mean for you and I. As I studied this, now this is probably an outflow of a probably five to six year study in my life from worship. I, I've always wanted to preach a message just on genuine worship and I, I really didn't have it nailed down until I began to look in the book of Amos. And I really want to help you this morning. I want you to understand what worship is. Uh, as we look at this book, I, I want us to understand that you know, the book of Amos was written uh, through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit from a farmer. Amos was a farmer. Amos is a very unique character in the Bible because Amos actually uh, is not a priest or of a noble descent like some of the other prophets. He's just a simple farmer. I mean, who else better to relate to us in Pitt County than a farmer? A farmer in Scripture. Uh, he tends sycamore trees and he was a sheep herder. And we see that in the beginning uh, of Amos. And so this morning I want us to think about a farmer's uh, words on worship. A farmer's words on worship. God had a message for Amos. God used, and another thing, and this is not the sermon, but it really got a hold of me, but the, the fact that God is, He's in the business of using anyone. You know that? He, hey, he used the noble, He used the pr priestly, He used those men of God, but God also used the simple lowly farmer named Amos. God wants to use you the same way He used little old Amos. We don't hear many sermons preached out of Amos. But may I tell you, the message of Amos says a mouthful, and hopefully we can grasp some of, some of that. But as we come to the book of Amos, we understand that the nation of Israel was actually in a time of prosperity and peace. They were actually also in a time of growth. And we all know the pattern of Israel. They were sometimes on fire for God, and sometimes they were lukewarm for God, and sometimes they were utterly cold for God. They didn't desire God at times. And we know what happened. What happens when Israel get, got cold? God sent judgment. God sent captivity. God sent the Babylonian Empire. God had His way to, to get them back to where He wanted them. And that's kind of what we're talking about today. But Israel was in a position of prosperity and almost to the point where they didn't even care really about serving God genuinely. Now when we read this passage, you will understand that quote unquote on the outside they were serving God. But on the inside, they were far from God. And if that ain't a message that needs to preach in our American churches today, I don't know what is. We come this morning in our suit and ties. We come this morning in our finest and we sit down on the pew and you know we, we feel like at times we've done God a favor by checking the list off and coming to church. But what God is concerned with this morning is not necessarily the outside. He's concerned with the inside because if the inside is right, the outside will be all right. And so this morning, let's look at Amos chapter 4. That's giving you some time to get there. We're going to look at a few verses and I'm going to mention a few verses as I get through the sermon for the sake of time. Amos chapter 4 and verse 4, it says, Come to Bethel and transgress 
and to Gilgal and multiply transgression. Now, you're going to see Bethel and Gilgal in there. Those were sacred places to the Jews. Those were places of worship and dedication. Those were places where they would go to the temple and they would worship. And so he's talking about basically in our vernacular, they were coming to church to give their offerings there in verse 4. And bring your sacrifices every morning and your tithes after three years. And offer a sacrifice of thanksgiving with leaven and proclaim and publish the free offerings. For this liketh you, O ye children of Israel, saith the Lord, of, Lord God. And I have also given you cleanness of teeth in all your cities and want of bread in your places. Yet ye have not returned unto me. Now turn over to chapter 5 and verse... Uh, chapter 5... In verse 21, God says, I hate, I despise your feast days. and I will not smell in your solemn assemblies. Though ye offer me burnt offerings and your meat offerings, I will not accept them. Neither will I regard the peace offering of your fat beasts. Take you away from me the noise of thy songs, for I will not hear the melody of thy vials, that's the string instruments. But let judgment run down as waters and righteousness as a mighty stream. Let us pray. Father, I pray that you would help us this morning to really understand the meaning of worship. And Lord, I know this morning that if there is a thought that is corrupted in our day, it certainly is the thought and idea of worship. And so, Father, help us to understand. I pray, Father, you would speak to hearts. I pray you would challenge hearts. I pray you would save souls this morning. I pray that someone would come to this altar and leave their sin here and walk away free, as the choir song already stated this morning. But we know that we can come to your cross and find salvation and find forgiveness and find mercy and grace. I pray, Father, that that would be found today. And, Lord, we'll thank you for that. In your precious and holy name we pray. Amen. Amen. I ask you the question this morning, what is worship? What is worship? Now, many things are probably going through your head. Maybe one or two things are going through your head. Is it coming to church? Is, is worship just coming to church? Now, I want you to understand, I'm going to say a few things that might turn your world upside down. But if you hang with me to the end of the service, you understand where, where we're headed here. Is worship coming to church? Is worship singing? I'm talking about worship at its center. I know this morning we've sung and, and, and we've come here and we've, we've come to Sunday school and you know, we've heard from the Word of God already. At its center is it singing? At its center is it just coming to the house of God? Is it doing some kind of service? Is that worship? Is, is worship this morning centered in our desires or God's desires? It's a very important question. Is worship centered in God's desire or our desire? Some things we need to ask ourselves. Is worship something that should primarily appeal to my flesh or the Word of God? That's a biggie today. Because you go to a lot of churches, what are they trying to do? They're trying to give you something that your flesh likes. This morning, and, and, and you know, we worked the fair booth all week, not last week, but the week before. And we ran into some people who had the mentality of, what can you do for me? Now, I understand part of that. You know, you want to make sure your church has a youth program. You want to make sure your church, I'm not, not knocking that. But basically what this individual and some of the others were getting at is, do you rock the house out? Do you jam for Jesus? What kind of concert do you have? You see, they have the wrong concept of what worship really is. Because I'm not concerned with what the world says about worship. I'm concerned with what God says about worship. That's where we go south. But again, the question today that needs to be asked, what is genuine worship and how does it impact my life and how important is it in my life? In our day, this subject has been tremendously confused. Many people don't realize the true meaning of worship. As I've already said, many people have the mentality of what can you do for me, not what I can do for you. 
You see, that's the question when you come into this house. That's the question Monday through Tuesday and Wednesday and Thursday and Friday and Saturday and Sunday. The question is asked or should be asked of us, not what you can do for me, but what I can do for you, my Lord. That is the attitude and lifestyle of worship. What can I do for you? Again this morning... Worship is not for us. You say, wait a minute now. Let me finish my statement. Worship is not for us. It is for Him. And it is, it is to be directed to Him. Not on our terms, but His terms. And that, my friend, is the problem of our world today. Worship is no longer in most churches directed towards God. It's more directed to our flesh and pleasing us. Worship should be centered around the Word of God. Say amen if you agree with that. Worship, and that's what makes us a dinosaur in this church movement today. You've got a lot of churches today that have become seeker friendly. Meaning, hey, if, you, if it feels good, do it. Look, we don't want to offend nobody. You come right on in the doors and you can do whatever you want to do. We're going, hey, look, we're going to jam for Jesus and then we're going to have a five minute devotion and then we're going to go home. May I tell you this morning, that is not biblical worship. Again, this morning, what does God say? Worship is more than music. It's more than offerings as the children of Israel were doing. It's more than an emotional feeling. Worship is more than feelings. When I was in Ohio, I'd deal with people on the altar at our camp meetings and stuff, and they would make the statement, I just don't feel it. And even some of the pastors would go and place their hand on the individuals. Lord, help them feel it. That's not biblical. Worship is more than an emotional feeling. And I'm not saying that we don't get emotionally worked up every once in a while and that's fine, that's good. But that's not worship. I'm building a case here. Bear with me. So here's the question that must be redirected to us. What is worship? Well, I looked up worship in the dictionary and here's what it said. It says, it's the act of showing respect and love for a God, especially by praying with other people who believe in the same God. The act of worshiping God or a God. It also said excessive admiration for someone. It also said reverence offered a, a divine being or a supernatural power, also an act of expressing such reverence. A form of religious practice with its creed and ritual, and that's become a lot of churches today. It's more of a going through the motions. Extravagant respect or admiration for a devotion to an object of esteem. Now, I've showed you the dictionary. Now, I want to show you what the word worship in the Bible means. When you, I went through the Hebrew word for worship, I went through the New Testament word for worship, and I began to do a personal study about what the word worship means in the Bible. Now, I'm going to tell you, Dex, uh, what is it? Webster's Dictionary has helped me an awful lot through the years, through college papers and through all kinds of other things. But if I really want to know what worship means, I'm not going to look to Webster's Dictionary. I'm going to look to what the Word of God says. So what does God say about worship? In the Hebrew, the word Hebrew, the Hebrew word for worship actually literally means to bow and stoop, to pay homage to or to reverence. May I tell you the word reverence has become a stranger in our churches today. May I tell you this is a sacred time. And Brother Matt, when he was preaching, he was talking about how this time is a sacred time. And surely, you know, I'll be honest with you, I think I almost forgot about that. But you know what? That, that is true. This is a sacred time. When the Word of God is being preached and taught to you, this is a sacred and reverential time. And we're to take it in and, and apply it to our lives. God wants to speak to you this morning. And so it's, a, it's, it's something to... It, it has the idea of bowing and stooping. The Greek word... It actually comes from two words, which this is something I never knew. It comes from two words, towards and to kiss. The idea being conveyed in biblical times would be to kiss the hand or ring of someone who is superior. It's the idea still of bowing and submitting. It's an act of reverence. It's showing superiority to one individual, to honor and kneel before. And that is the idea of New Testament worship. 
Now let me put it together for you so you can understand. I actually, it's already on the screen for you. It is safe to say that worship in biblical terms is an act of humility. It is not about us, but rather the one who we bow to. Amen? It is honoring Him in the biblical sense. Notice what I said, in the biblical sense. It is a lifestyle, not just something we do three times a week. We are to honor and please Him with our lives. It is a matter of the heart. It is a life that is all wrapped up in Him. That is worship, my friends. Worship is a 24-7 lifestyle. Worship begins at salvation and does not ever end. Amen? Worship is not something I just do in this building. Worship is something I do outside this building, inside this building, whether we're at a car wash for the youth, whether we're doing a cutting grass, or whether it doesn't matter what we're doing. Worship is a 24-7, a part of our life. When we trust Christ as our Savior, we are to worship Him constantly, honoring Him, living for Him. And we're going to get to the bottom of this. But I want us to note, number one, their problem. Let's look at their problem. What was their problem? Why was God getting ready to rain down fiery wrath and judgment upon His people? We understand, first of all, that their problem is simply this. They were going through the motions. Notice here in uh, verse 4 of chapter 4, the Bible tells us uh, there, He says, Come to Bethel and transgress, and Gilgal multiply transgression, and bring your sacrifices every morning and your tithes after three years, and offer a sacrifice of thanksgiving with leaven, and proclaim and publish the free offerings, for this liketh you. They love that. They love to come to the temple. They love to give their tithes. They love to sing His praises. We saw that in chapter 5 where God says, I'm not even, I hear you singing, but it's not blessing me. They were, they were just going through the motions. Here's what they were doing. They were coming Sunday morning. They were coming Sunday night. They were coming Wednesday night. They were faithful. They showed up at the women's auxiliary. They showed up at master's men. They showed up to dig if a church needed something to dig. They showed up to the kitchen on Wednesday morning to clean the kitchen. We have, have a, um, a little mouse problem that's been running in there we've been trying to tackle. And, you know, he's caused a lot of trouble for us in that kitchen. You know, and, and, and yeah, they were the type of people that were there to, to help out. And they were the type of people uh, to show up and be, be supposedly faithful on the outside. But the problem was the inside. It wasn't real to them. It was just, it's just normal. It's just what we do. But genuinely in their heart, they failed to worship God. Preacher, you mean to tell me they came to church they gave their tithes, they sang the praises of God, and yet they were not right with God. That's what we see in the Bible here. They were just going through the motions. May I tell you, there's a lot of people in our world today that are just going through the motions. Worship is more than this house. Worship is more than dropping money in the offering plate. Worship is more than doing some service for God. And this is what God was trying to get at. You're just going through the motions, and I'm not happy about it, God said. Again, they, they came to the temple, they gave, and they sang. And we read over in chapter 5, in verse 22, or verse 23, He says, Take thou away from me the noise of thy songs, for I will not hear the melody of thy voice. God, they were singing, they were giving, they were attending church, they were being faithful at those things, but on the inside, they were dead. Think about this this morning. I want to ask you a question. Why are you here? Are you here just because you're afraid the preacher's going to call you? Are you here just because, you're, because it's the right thing to do? Or are you here because you love the Savior and you desperately want to get something from Him? There's a difference. Genuine worship. I want us to note, we see that they were faithful church members. We see that they were givers. We see that they were singers. But look in verse 12. He begins to identify number two, their, or not number two, but the second point is their lifestyle. Look there in verse 12 of chapter 5. The Bible says in verse 12 of chapter 5, For I know your manifold transgressions and your mighty sins. They afflict the just, they take a bribe, and they turn aside the poor at the gate from their right. What is God saying? He says, I know all about your life. Yes, you worship me on Sunday morning and Sunday night and Wednesday night. 
Yes, you, you come to me and yes, you, you give these things and yes, you do this and yes, you do that. You do great things. But on the inside, your lifestyle is not right. There's some things I have found manifold transgression or sin within your heart. And he identifies a few of those. Notice in verse 2 of chapter 5. In chapter 5 and verse 2, the virgin Israel is fallen. She shall no more rise. She is forsaken upon her land. There is none to raise her up. What had happened? They, they had been forsaken by God. God had forsaken them. Preacher, you mean to tell me they were faithful and they did all these things. And man, the, the checklist that we have, the fundamental checklist of whether we're right with God or not, they were doing all those things. And yet God was not with them. Think about it this morning. But then he, 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 He's liking them to a young dead woman. I mean, when we have somebody in our society who dies young, what do we say? What a tragedy. They had so much potential. They had so much life to live and offer this world, and yet they're gone. And that's the way God looks at His people here. He says, you have so much potential, and yet you're dead. Yet, on the inside, you're not even my servant. What a tragedy. What do you think God thinks when He looks upon the modern church of America today? But notice also that right was abandoned. Look there in verse 7 of chapter 5. The Bible tells us in verse 7, Ye who turn judgment to wormwood and leave off righteousness in the earth. The word leave off there is the word abandon. They had abandoned righteousness. They had abandoned what's right. They were no longer concerned about what God had to say. And you know what I found out in our church today, in the churches of America, we don't care what God says. We're going to do what we want to do. I can't tell you how many people I've sat across in their home. Well, you, you, I understand the way you feel, but that, you know, that's not the way I see it. It don't matter the way I see it. It don't matter the way you see it. But it does matter the way He sees it. This morning, this is Bible. I'm not giving you my opinion. But see, right was abandoned. We can come in here and we can sing great songs that make us cry. We can come in here and testify. And we can come in here and shout the walls down. We can come in here and, and, and do great things. And we can have a big youth group. We can have a big number. We can do all those things. But if we are not interested in doing what is right and standing for what is right, God's not interested. And that's the problem with our churches today. I'm not saying we're perfect this morning. This morning, God is identifying their lifestyle and showing them that their worship is futile. They rejected the word, and, and we kind of said it, but look there in verse 10. They hate him that rebuketh the, at the, in the gate, and they abhor him that speaketh uprightly. They rejected the men of God. You know, I'm nobody special. I'm just the man that God sent your way. And I, I'm, I'm not perfect. I make mistakes. I have my own set of problems. Just ask my wife. She's here this morning. She'll say, amen, shout the walls down. But may I tell you this morning, whether you like me or whether you don't, God has placed me here. I'm just doing what God wants me to do. I'm trying my best. This morning, as the preacher is preaching from the Word of God, the best thing we can do is block me out and listen to this. This morning, they rejected the Word. They rejected the men that gave it. They lost their compassion. Look, look in verses 11 and 12. For as much therefore as your treading is upon the poor, and ye take from him burdens of wheat, ye have built houses of hewn stone, but ye shall not dwell in them. Look at verse 12. For I know your manifold transgressions are the mighty sins. They afflict the just. They take a bribe and they turn aside the poor in the gate. They had lost their compassion. May I tell you this morning, when we lose our compassion for souls, when we lose our compassion for the poor, those in need, when we lose our compassion as a church for those on the outside, God says, I'm not happy with your worship. This is all a part of it. 
God is giving them a checklist. He is showing them through the farmer that you are living in sin and what you are doing, you may be coming to church and you may be crossing your T's and dotting your I's on the outside, but I have found you lacking. And your worship is futile. They were corrupt. We read that in verse 13 of chapter 5. Therefore the prudent shall keep silence in that time, for it is an evil time. They were corrupt. And you know, here's the scariest part of it all. And here's, here's the, what I'm getting ready to say is the main problem of the church of today. And God calls them on it right here. I found that very interesting. Look in verse 18 through 20 of chapter 5. God says, Woe unto you that desire the day of the Lord. To what end is it for you? The day of the Lord is darkness and not light. As if a man did flee from a lion and a bear met him or went into the house and leaned his hand on the wall and a serpent bit him, shall not the day of the Lord be darkness and not light, even very dark, and no brightness in it? What is he saying? They were anticipating the return of the Lord. They were, they were thinking that they were right with God. They said, boy, oh, I hope he comes today. But they were nowhere near ready for him to come. He says, woe unto you. You're not ready. The day of the Lord for you is not light. It's darkness. And here's my fear as a pastor in the church of today. We're preaching and ministering to a lot of people. The Word of God is given out. Sins are dealt with. Sins are hit hard in the pulpit. And nobody responds. Want to know why? Because we think we're right with God. And yet all these things this morning, some of these things have hit you right square between the eyes as they've hit me this week. And God says you need to get right because your worship is not complete. You see, they thought they were right. And they were wrong. Let me tell you, if your life doesn't line up with this book, you're wrong. If your life is not directed and guided by this book, if your life is not filled with full, genuine, heartfelt worship of God, you're wrong. If your worship consists of Sunday morning and Sunday night and Wednesday night and giving an offering and, and, and doing good things for the church, if that's what consists of your worship, you're wrong. You're not right. And I'm getting to a point here. Understand this morning that these people were supposed to be the light of the world. They were God's chosen people. They were the ones that God was going to use to spread His good news. But because of their sin, because of their misconception of worship, God had disqualified them and was going to judge them. Let me tell you something this morning. We're supposed to be the children of God. We're supposed to be the light of the world. How can we be the light of the world? How can we reach out to people? How can we do and, and, and do the things that God is pleased with? How can we please God at Belleville Free Baptist Church if there is sin in the camp? We can't. One sin, the sin of Achan, deterred the entire nation of Israel. May I tell you this morning, if you are living in sin and you go to this church, may I plead with you, may I beg you this morning to come down and deal with the sin, get it right, so that we as a church can move forward. This morning, God's interested in dealing with your sin. You want to worship God? You want to have heartfelt worship? Deal with your sin. Their lifestyle. But then look at the, God's efforts. Look at God's effort. We see God's efforts in verse, chapter 4 and verse 6. Chapter 4 and verse 6. He begins to list a few things. Let's start in verse 7. This is where I read verse 6. And also I have withheld the rain from you. When there was yet three months to the harvest, and I caused it to rain upon the city, and I caused it not to rain upon another city, one piece was rained upon, and the piece whereupon it rained not withered. So two or three cities wandered into the city to drink water, but they were not satisfied. Yet have ye not returned unto me, saith the Lord. I have smitten you with blasting and mildew. 
When your, garden, when your gardens and your vineyards and your fig trees and your olive trees increased, the palmer worm devoured them, yet ye have not returned unto me, saith the Lord. I have sent among you the pestilence after the manner of Egypt. Your young men have I slain with a sword, and I have taken away your horses, and I have made you the stink of your camps to come up into your nostrils, yet have ye not returned unto me, saith the Lord. Do you see what God's saying here? What is it going to take this morning for you to get right with God? God says, I'm trying to get you back where you need to be. I've sent calamity after calamity after calamity, and yet you still do not repent of your sin. You know, some of us this morning, it may not be everybody, but some of us are having hardship after hardship after hardship because God is trying to get us back to Him. Sometimes sorrow comes in our life because God wants to get us back to Him. Sometimes tragedy strikes in our life because God is trying to get our attention. I've met people in my life that have told me that a loss of a family member is what it took to get them where they need to be. I've met people who have told me that a loss of a job or, or financial status is what it took for God to get their attention. Let me tell you, they, they were faced with calamity after calamity. Look at all the things in Amos that God did to try to draw them back to Himself. And yet the Bible continually says in this chapter that they would not return. You know what I've discovered about you and I? We are hard-headed people. And God, you know, and I've heard, I've had a guy tell me this in church. He says, I don't understand. I was talking about how God sometimes sends judgment in our life. He says, well, that doesn't sound like a loving God to me. I said, well, let me, let me back up here. Let's, let's think about what you just said. A God who bled and died on the cross of Calvary for you is trying to get your attention so that you can live right and one day be in heaven forever and ever with Him is trying to send something in your life to restore that relationship. And you want to say that's mean? You see, this morning we got, a, we got a weird way of looking at that. You better thank God that God loves you enough to send those things in your life. Because it's all about Him getting back with you. He loves you this morning. You see, God sent calamity after calamity. But look at God's warning in verse 12. Verse 12 of chapter 4. Therefore thus will I do unto thee, O Israel, and because I will do this unto thee, prepare to meet thy God, O Israel. For lo, he that formeth the mountains and createth the winds and declareth unto the man what is his thought, that maketh the morning darkness and treadeth upon the high places of the earth, the Lord, the God of hosts is his name. Here's what God's warning was. Prepare to meet thy God. God's saying you won't turn back and you don't care. See, they didn't care. They were going through the motions and they were happy. Maybe some of you this morning say, Preacher, I'm happy where I'm at. Everything's okay, hunky-dory. I don't need anything. I don't need what you're talking about this morning. I'm going to keep doing. Well, here's what God says to those individuals. He says, you won't turn back. You don't care. You keep living in, in the state that you're living in and doing what you want. God says, fine. You better get ready to meet me and stand before me. Because then it is too late. Prepare to meet thy God. And a sobering thing to this pastor this morning, there are countless people sitting in churches all over this country and all over the world today that think they are living right, think that they're living right, but yet their life, Monday through Friday, bears it out in no way, bears out the name of Christ. And they think they're right. And God's message to them is prepare to meet me. Get right or prepare to meet me. But then finally this morning, talking about worship. What is God's answer? God's answer is really easy. He doesn't give us some 20 point outline. He really gives us two words. He gives us two words. Let's look there and we'll be done. God's answer. Verse, chapter 5 and verse 4 through 8. The Bible says in verse 4, For thus saith the Lord unto the house of Israel, Seek ye me and ye shall live. That is God's answer this morning. That is true, genuine worship. What is God trying to get us to do in our life? He's trying to get us to seek Him. That's what worship is. It's seeking Him. 
It's desiring Him. The word seek. I searched up, did a word study on the word seek in the Bible. And here's what the word means. It's a very large meaning and it has a very focused point. Here's what it means. A demanding, dominant, and intense desire to pursue, to learn of, to know of, to follow, and to care for with intense passion. Do you see that right there? Are you seeking God actively in your life? Are you seeking God? Do you have an all-out encompassing desire that dominates everything within you to, to know God more, to love God more, to know Him more? It's kind of a, an informational word. It's a word that has the idea of sitting at the feet of and learning from. May I tell you this morning, do you have that desire in your life? Because if you do, that is true heaven-sent worship. What does God say? He says, number one, desire me and you will live. We saw that in verse 4. He says, if, if you'll desire me, if you'll seek me, you will live. He's the answer this morning. Desire me and not religion. Look in verse 5 of chapter 5. He says, but seek not Bethel or enter into Gilgal. Talking about the temples there. And pass not to Beersheba, for Gilgal shall surely go into captivity. What is God saying? Desire me and not religion. Are you right with God? I'm a Catholic. Are you right with God? Well, I'm a Baptist. Didn't ask you that. I'm right with God. I'm a free will Baptist. No, 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 no. Do you know Him? And are you actively seeking Him? You see, salvation is a relationship, not a religion. That's worship. Worship is not in places or things we do. It is in a person named Jesus. This is where God is trying to get us to. Desire me, for I am the creator of all things. Look at verse 8 in chapter 5. He says, Seek him that maketh the seven stars in the Orion and turneth the shadow of death into morning and maketh the day dark with night that calleth for the waters of the sea and poureth them out upon the face of the earth. The Lord is his name. Seek the one who created it all. May I tell you this morning, you are searching for something. There's individuals out here this morning, you've spent years trying to fill the void with the sports. You've spent years trying to fill the void with accomplishments. Trying to fill the void with things that you think will make you happy. And yet, here you sit this morning, you're not happy. You're miserable. You hear the preacher preaching and you know those sins that were mentioned are things that you struggle with. You're not faithful to God. You're not living for God. And God says, I can give you purpose this morning. I am the creator of all things. This morning, we have been created to know God. We have been created to have a relationship with Him. Genesis to Revelation is all about a holy God who loves you enough and He wants to know you this morning. He wants to get close to you this morning. He's not somewhere hiding where you can't see Him. This morning, He's here. All you have to do is receive Him this morning. You can have a relationship you can drop your sin, repent of your sin, and turn from your sin this morning, and turn to Jesus this morning, and begin a worship life. A relationship filled with worship, and intently seeking Him, and knowing Him more. You know, some of y'all are looking at me this morning like a deer with the headlights look. I know this is foreign, but this is how far we've come. This is worship. Desire me, and I will not forsake you. Look at verse 14. Chapter 5, seek God and not evil that ye may live. And so the Lord, the God of hosts, shall be with you as ye have spoken. Notice what God says here. He says, seek me and I'll be with you. Then he says, desire me and I'll show you grace. Look at verse 15. Hate the evil and love the good. And establish judgment in the gate and it, it may be the Lord God of hosts will be gracious unto the remnant of Joseph. This morning, grace is not offered through works. We know that. Grace is offered through knowing Jesus. This morning, salvation is not in a thing. It's in a person. It's in Jesus. It's not in a church. It's in Jesus. I want to ask you a question this morning. Do you know the Lord as your Savior? If you were to die right now, I didn't ask you if you attend church. I didn't ask you if you give your tithes. I didn't ask you if you sung in the choir. I didn't ask you if you do great things for our church. I didn't ask you all that. I'm asking you this morning, do you truly know Christ as your Savior? Because if your life does not bear out, and here's the thing in conclusion this morning, worship again is a lifestyle of desiring God. 
seeking God, following God. It's a relationship. Matter of fact, the word worship is used several times in the New Testament in continual action, meaning it's something that we never stop doing. Think about it. And we thought worship was just coming to church. It's not biblical. You say, wait a minute, preacher, are you giving me a get out of church free card? Uh Uh-uh. You see, catch it now, don't lose it. God gave me this. I didn't have this in my sermon, and God came to me. I know the Lord spoke to my heart about this, but it's so true. Singing, tithing, and church attendance, and being faithful and serving Him is all just an overflow from our heart of worship of Him. Catch it. Here it is. If you're truly saved this morning, you truly know Him, you're going to be here. If you're truly saved this morning and you're worshiping Him in your life, I don't have to tell you about giving. If you're truly saved and you're truly worshiping the Lord, I don't have to tell you to sing out loud. I don't have to tell you to testify. I don't have to tell you to to be teenagers at the service project on Saturday. I don't have to tell you, teenager, to be here or be there. I don't have to tell you, adults, to be in church on Wednesday night and Sunday night. I don't have to tell you those things. Why? Because out of a heart of worship, I want to be here. Ooh. This morning, it's all about worship. How is your worship in your life today? Do you truly know Christ as your Savior? Do you truly long to follow Him and know more about Him? I know this morning this is a tough subject. But if you don't know Christ as your Savior this morning, would you come and receive Christ? Because He'll save you. He'll take you in. All you got to do is walk up. And maybe you're in here this morning, you know Christ, and there's some things that you know in your life have been waning. You've, you've kind of jumbled up your priorities. Maybe God has spoken to your heart about true worship. Maybe you would like to come and respond. It's not saying you're a horrible person. It's saying you're an individual that wants to get right with God and loves your Lord and wants to be in a right relationship. With every head bowed and every eye closed.